Hello, everyone. Hello, we'll just give it a second for as people are joining. Hello, hello, thanks for joining us. All right, let, let's get started. Um, hello, and welcome to the FIU IB Speaker Series. My name is Jillian Avendano, and I'm the Program Director at FIU Center for International Business Education and Research. I'm joined here by my colleague at Cyber, Dr. Luciana Kube as well. And um, so a little bit about Cyber is that um, Cyber is a grant from the U.S. Department of Education. FIU hosts uh, one of the 16 centers with the purpose of promoting U.S. competitiveness in international business. We have a great webinar today, and the topic of today's webinar are... Uh, <laughs> Grand Challenges and International Business, the Power of Configurational Research. And we're joined today by Dr. Stav Feinschmidt, who is an Associate Professor of International Business and Strategy at FIU Business, and, us, and also um, Dr. Krista Llewellyn, who is an Associate Professor of Management and the MBA Director at Florida Southern College. Um, and just wanted to also add that uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end. So please feel free to add your questions in the chat and uh, take it away, Stav and Krista. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Jill. Uh, and thank you all um, for taking the time to, uh, to join us uh, this morning, afternoon or evening, wherever, uh, wherever you are uh, around the globe. Um, uh, big thanks also to uh, Krista, who agreed to uh, join me today for this uh, cool webinar. And of course, uh, Jill and Lucy for setting this up and, and coordinating uh, the event. So in terms of what um, what we have planned for today, um, kind of three uh, parts. Uh, the first part uh, will be me just uh, uh, describing the basic uh, elements um, of configura the configurational, new configurational approach. Uh, the second part, uh, Chris, will be Krista uh, talking about grand challenges and why a uh, new configurational approach is particularly suitable for studying grand challenges. Uh, and then in the third part, we'll uh, have uh, hopefully a kind of a rich uh, back and forth uh, with the um, uh, attendees about what can be done with it and and, and so on. So, uh, so let me start um, uh, with the with the first part. Um, the kind of configurational way of thinking uh, about um, international business, more broadly, uh, business uh, phenomena is not uh, entirely new. Uh, there is quite a bit of configurational uh, research or attempts at configurational research. Um, uh, uh, way back uh, in the in the 80s and so on. And I can think of the, for instance, the Miles and Snow uh, typology uh, that is uh, uh, quite famous in strategy research. But this uh, kind of more traditional classical configurational approach uh, had two uh, kind of issues. The first one is that the analytical tools that existed at the time uh, were not really suitable for um, uh, dealing with uh, configurational uh, ideas or, or phenomena. Uh, and the second um, is that the configurational approaches at the time were um, such that um, all the conditions that are considered in the configurational framework were part of every single configuration in one form of another. Um, but with the emergence of the kind of new configurational, neo-configurational uh, approach, um, these two uh, issues have been uh, sort of addressed. Um, uh, one, by having uh, qualitative comparative analysis or positive qualitative comparative analysis as a, um, as, as a methodological tool that um, really gives us a lot more analytical power in terms of uh, examining configurations. And also the understanding that um, some configurations um, 
may be comprised of several attributes of or, or conditions, but these attributes or conditions may be completely relevant in other configurations that are equally um, uh, relevant for a certain outcome of interest. There are several excellent, uh, uh, quite a few actually, primers on uh, the new configurational approach and qualitative comparative analysis and so on. So uh, we, we don't want to go too much uh, into that. And if anybody is um, is interested and wants some guidance on where to find that stuff, then um, uh, feel free to uh, to reach out to us uh, either later in the session or after. Uh, after the session. So um, what is this configurational or new configurational approach? Um, the core assumption is that causation is complex. Uh, we're studying um, phenomena that are complex, inherently complex. And so taking a, a sort of a net effects thinking, kind of a reductive kind of, uh, you do more of X, you get more of Y. Uh, and that's about, about it, might be problematic. And so the, the questions that are kind of in, in a very general form that, are, that typically come out of a configurational approach are uh, what configurations of attributes or conditions are associated with an outcome of interest. With the near configurational approach, um, we treat cases or observations as set theoretic configurations. Uh, in other words, each case is actually a bundle of different uh, conditions. Um, and uh, because we're taking a set theoretic approach, we don't really deal with variables. Uh, we deal with sets or conditions. Um, a variable is, for instance, something like um, temperature. So temperature is a variable, right? It's it's on a scale. Um, it's, it's, it's a number. Uh, but fever is a condition that is sort of interpreted or uh, inferred from, from, from temperature, right? Then it requires uh, some judgment. Um, with, the, with the configurational approach, um, we're, like I said, we're dealing with sets and cases or observations in data can be members of these sets or conditions there. They can be non-members and they can be members or non-members to different degrees. So one of the cool things about the configurational approach is that uh, conditions um, uh, kind of uh, have distinctions in kind, whether a certain condition is present or not, but also in degree, the degree to which the condition is present or not present. And that's um, uh, a really unique uh, feature of the configurational approach and of this concept of set or uh, conditions. Um, we're also with the configurational approach not uh, interested in net effects thinking. So what happens to y when x goes up by uh, by one uh, unit? Um, we're actually interested in necessity and sufficiency relations between sets. Um, so um, which conditions are necessary for the outcome? To be present for the outcome to occur, and which combinations of conditions are sufficient for the outcome to occur. And as you can see, this is certainly um, uh, more complex, or in fact, accommodates the complexity of how um, phenomena in, 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 in business and in social studies in general uh, tend, tend to be. So some of the uh, fundamental elements um, the, uh, the first one is conjunctural causation. Um, so, um, in general terms, conjunctural causation means that outcomes are brought about by how conditions work together, by how they combine. Um, and so if you think about, um, um, something like, uh, making a delicious carrot cake, um, then um, uh, the uh, conjunctural causation is reflected in the fact that you have a recipe and the delicious carrot cake is the result of all these elements in the, in the recipe working together, right? Which suggests that there is these complementarities between the ingredients uh, in the recipe that lead to 
the outcome, which is a delicious uh, carrot cake. The second one is equationality, which suggests that there is more than one recipe to make a delicious carrot cake. Um, and uh, because that's the case, it may well be that um, there might be a way to substitute ingredients between recipes, right? So we might have one recipe to make a carrot cake where there are five ingredients, but it is possible that you could take two ingredients out and bring another ingredient that wasn't part of the five um, and still get a delicious carrot cake, um, suggesting that there's some substitution going on there. Um, and uh, finally, uh, causal asymmetry um, is uh, suggests that um, the configurations or combinations of ingredients or conditions that lead to the outcome, the absence of these conditions does not necessarily lead to the absence uh, of the of the outcome. Um, and so, um, as you can see, uh, having these kind of three fundamental elements uh, really uh, helps with accommodating the complex nature of, uh, of phenomena. So um, let me uh, just briefly give an example. So this is from a, a Jeeves paper by Donald Creeley. Um, it's a paper that um, examines uh, the stakeholder orientation of foreign subsidiaries, and it can be broad and it can be uh, narrow uh, and uh, to different degrees as well. So there's differences in kind and there's also differences in degrees. But what we can see here and uh, ignore for, for a second the, um, the size of the, of the circles um, and uh, just and all these different numbers, um, and just kind of uh, pay attention to uh, whether a circle is, uh, is filled or crossed with a filled circle suggesting that something is present and a cross circle suggesting that something is absent. So the first configuration or um, recipe uh, suggests that subsidiaries that have R&D intensity, government influence, uh, operating in a developed host country and global revenue um, they will have a broad stakeholder orientation. So this is a recipe that is sufficient for a broad stakeholder uh, orientation. And notice that there is conjunctural causation here. There are complementarities. These four ingredients, these four conditions work together to bring about a broad stakeholder orientation. Notice, however, that there are five other recipes that's equally, that similarly, um, uh, with some nuance there, there's some technicalities in terms of um, kind of the degree to which they uh, bring this state board stakeholder orientation, but they do nonetheless. Um, and we can see that there are a total of six recipes or configurations that can bring about a broad stakeholder orientation. This is the equifinality. Uh, element that I mentioned earlier. And um, when we uh, compare um, configurations one and two or recipes one and two, we can see that um, they have some similarities, but um, we can see that if we take government influence and global revenue from the first one and we replace it with flat in the second one, we still get a broad stakeholder orientation. So it suggests that there is a substitution between government influence and global revenue and slack on the on the other hand notice uh, uh, also that there's causal asymmetry what i mean is that the six recipes that lead to a broad stakeholder orientation the mirror image of these recipes or configurations are not necessarily what leads to a narrow stakeholder orientation. Um, and this is where we see this kind of um, asymmetry because it could be that there are, that the, for instance, the mirror images of some of these six recipes actually lead to something that is um, neither, uh, something that is um, in between, or it could be that there are other um, uh, solutions or configurations that lead to 
narrow stakeholder orientation. So this is just to uh, give um, a, a brief, very, very brief um, overview of what it means to take a configurational or new configurational uh, approach um, more accurately. And as you can see, this can be both a way to theorize and also a way to, uh, to analyze uh, data um, in terms of um, uh, theorizing. Um, it can be useful in terms of developing typologies. And these typologies can be monothetic, which is kind of like the miles and snow and kind of earlier things. But they can also be polythetic, which is um, when uh, some conditions play a role in some recipes, but in other recipes, they're completely irrelevant. Um, and, and so very useful from a typological standpoint, uh, but also very useful from a taxonomical standpoint. Uh, we can see here that uh, the data says that there is a certain taxonomy uh, of subsidiaries with a broad and narrow stakeholder um, orientation, right? So it's, it's a useful tool both from theorizing configurations in terms of how do we think about explaining certain outcomes, um, but it's also useful as, as, as a methodological uh, approach. So um, uh, with that, I'll, um, I'll pass it on to, uh, to, to Krista now um, to talk uh, a little bit about grand challenges and why taking this kind of uh, approach is particularly suitable there. All right. Thank you, Stav. And if you want to go to the next slide. I'm going to start our discussion with a widely used uh, definition of what we mean by grand challenges. So grand challenges are ambitious but achievable objectives that harness science, technology, and innovation to solve important national or global problems and that have the potential to capture the public's imagination. They uh, Grand challenges are, represent a wide variety of global problems and probably the most universal and well-known uh, grand challenges are those that are associated with the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the SDGs of the United Nations. These include things such as eradicating poverty, reducing uh, disparities in, in um, income and wealth, combating climate change, as well as transitioning to sustainable and affordable energy sources. And so as we see from those examples, grand challenges transcend societal, economic, and geographic borders and are relevant at multiple uh, levels of analysis. And therefore, they're definitely multinational in nature. And there's also been, uh, there's been numerous editorials and special issues and review articles in our top journals such as the one uh, written by uh, Buckley, Doe, and uh, Bernischke and Jibs in 2017 that have called for international business um, and management scholars to get involved in, um, in research that focuses on understanding and, and helping to solve these persistent grand challenges. Um, this includes exploring questions uh, that focus on how MNEs may assist um, in uh, solving these problems, as well as international comparative uh, research that looks at interventions um, across and within nations and regions. And these articles that, that um, talk about um, you know, being motivated to, to get involved in this type of research, they also stress that engaging in this type of research um, involves a variety of paradoxes, trade-offs, contradictions, in other words, uh, complexity is a hallmark of doing research in the realm of grand challenges, all of which strongly suggests using a configurational approach and methods may be an effective way um, to uh, start to deal with the complexity, but also engage um, in it with it in a deeper way uh, that may help us refine our IB theories about interactions between various actors in a global um, context. So um, by approaching the study of grand challenges in a configurational manner, um, we're able to account for those fundamental elements of complexity that Stav talked about. And to illustrate this, uh, um, let's broadly consider a grand challenge such as mitigating climate change. So with that grand challenge, a holistic understanding 
would involve, um, you know, considering a multitude of factors such as energy policies, technological innovations, economic incentives. And QCA would allow um, researchers to analyze how these different combinations of these factors can be equally effective in contributing to different, um, you know, to successful climate change uh, strategies. And again, kind of um, illustrating equifinality. With the configurational approach, it also recognizes that these various factors and strategies for mitigating um, climate change are, in, you know, are interconnected and interdependent, and that um, you know, adoption of, of one may reinforce um, you know, others. And then since we know that the effectiveness of uh, climate change um, mitigation strategies uh, vary based on geography, um, economies, cultures. The with configurational methods, we can also account for those contextual specificities that are so important. The um, configurational approaches can help us identify combinations that um, lead to significant and nonlinear reductions in, say, greenhouse gas emissions or enhanced climate resilience. Um, these types of research designs provide the way to um, identify and explore synergies or the complementarities between different climate change uh, mitigation strategies, such as um, the adoption of renewable energy and afforestation, for example. It also can maybe uncover uh, or help us uncover potential trade-offs, such as the tension between economic growth and strict um, emission regulations. And uh, with QCA, it also can help us um, identify unconventional or innovative patterns that haven't been considered previously. Uh, and finally, uh, as I started uh, on this slide, we know that mitigating climate change is a complex task and it involves numerous interacting factors. And by using configurational methods, we can facil uh, facilitate a deeper engagement with this complexity by allowing researchers to analyze multiple conditions simultaneously and understanding that there's various ways that uh, policies, public attitudes, and technological innovations can combine to effectively, hopefully, mitigate climate change. So I wanna further illustrate um, how this configurational research uh, can be used to, to tackle uh, causal complexity. Um, at the intersection of M&E um, activities and grand challenges. And so I want us um, um, to consider a study, a recent study by Patala et al. that was published in JIBS in 2022. And it focuses on the grand challenge associated with the transition from non-renewable energy, fossil fuels, to renewable sources of energy. And their uh, theoretical inspiration actually comes from the classic um, Rugman and Verbeek, um, IB, FSA, you know, firm specific advantages, country specific advantages matrix. And the, um, that matrix highlights the need for MNEs to combine non-location bound transferable, um, you know, firm specific advantages with host country CSAs. So that word combine, um, you know, uh, the, the need to combine these multi-level conditions really makes the case for using configurational research. Also, since some of these um, FSAs um, you know, are likely to be location bound, the transfer of, of the FSAs alone are likely to be insufficient on their own to uh, drive the um, you know, transition or the investment uh, into renewables, because they'll, the MNEs will also need to develop uh, some FSAs in the host country so that it complements um, you know, their, their home country advantages. So again, this idea that we, we have conditions that need to um, have synergies or complement one another, um, it makes it another um, you know, great example for using a configurational approach with QCA methods. So in this study, um, the authors, they use a, a data set that is uh, 289 greenfield investments from 17 multinational energy utility companies that are from 14 countries. 
and the investments are in 42 host countries. And it's a, a time period of 2010 to 2017. And as you um, see on this slide, their analysis identified five configurations that lead to these uh, firms investing um, across borders in renewables. And it also, um, they also uh, do the analysis for um, investment in non-renewables. And we'll talk a little bit about that if we, um, depending on how my time's going. But we see here the, um, we'll focus first on the, the five that are focused on renewables. So we see that configurations R1, R2, R3, these represent uh, privately owned, internationalized MNEs with high technological capabilities. And we see this um, you know, by looking at the, the filled in circles that are there for technological capabilities and international experience and the crossed out circle um, for state ownership indicating that these are um, privately owned. And these core conditions, um, you know, they're mutually reinforcing one another, um, these firm specific core conditions as complements. And notably, the, the presence of the host country CSAs are not um, you know, key drivers in these configurations, uh, with the exception of R2, which does have the, the presence of host uh, country public incentives as a, uh, a peripheral uh, condition. And so we see that the, the firms that have membership in these configurations are investing in a number of diverse um, you know, uh, environments or country environments. And with, uh, with QCA, another um, element that you can uh, bring into, into the design is to really engage with the, the Q part, the qualitative part. And in this study, um, the researchers um, did provide case illustrations. So for instance, uh, they describe how the Italian firm Enel which has strong membership in configuration R1, more than doubled its capacity in renewables through investments in nine different host countries across four different continents. And so another um, um, dimension that of configurational research that really adds richness and nuance to the interpretation and understanding of the findings is to label the configurations. And Frenari et al. in their AMR paper, where they describe the process of configurational theorizing, um, they note that this is a really important part of that process because it's a way to demonstrate the, the underlying orchestrating themes or mechanisms um, of the configuration and of the way that the conditions are interacting. And so in this study, the authors, um, they labeled R1, R2, R3, as internationalized technology forerunners. And am I doing okay on time to talk a little bit about R4 and R5? Okay. So with configurations R4 and R5, these are characterized by state ownership, low international experience and defensive strategies in developed markets. And they, the authors refer to these configurations as incentive driven home region based state-owned MNEs. So in, in, in um, analyzing or interpreting the configurations, um, we sometimes will will contrast them to, you know, to the other um, the other types. So um, if we contrast these two to the previous three configurations, what we see here is that the host country, the host countries in these configurations are providing CSAs in the form of incentives, and they're also characterized by having, um, you know, uh, declining emission trends. And these are core conditions, it's a core condition, suggesting that these host countries would be relatively low risk targets, um, you know, for making investment in renewables. So in R4, we see that there is the presence of um, host country CSAs, such as public investments, and a decreasing trend in, in emissions. And in R5, we have the host country conditions that uh, represent um, high growth in demand and a declining trend in emissions. So we're seeing some complementarities between these country specific admissions as well. 
And um, these configurations also include um, the absence of international experience as a core condition, which implies that um, the firms that have membership in these configurations are primarily focusing on their domestic market and existing operations. And I'm, I'm getting close to finishing up, but I, I do want to um, do a little bit of comparison of the patterns um, between these two configurations with the three internationalized technology forerunners. And so we see that the MNEs, um, the privately owned MNEs and state owned MNEs, they're really differing in their approach to investing in renewables. They both invest in renewables, but they're, they're taking a different approach. So the privately owned MNEs are relying on uh, the FSAs, you know, both technological capabilities and renewables and their international ex experience, while the state-owned MEs are relying more so on the CSAs and they, they favor less risky or you know, geographically proximate um, host countries. And so with, with traditional net effects uh, correlation-based research design, it, it would be very difficult to tease out the various ways that different types of MNEs can be part of the solution uh, to these grant, you know, to this grand challenge, and you know, of making this transition from non-renewables to renewables. And so I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't want to, I want to leave plenty of time for our discussion. Uh, so I'll, I won't go into uh, some of the patterns with the, uh, the four configurations that lead to. Uh, non, uh, you know, investment in non-renewables. Again, I would just highlight that they do, um, you know, produce some evidence of this uh, causal asymmetry that that Stav talked about. And I think I will kind of stop there because I'd really like to um, see if we can have some engagement from, um, you know, the other participants. And Stav, unless you you were you know a lot about this paper too, if, if there's anything you want to um, add. Um, well, I, there was actually a, a question in the in the Q and A um, mm -hmm. that I think we can answer through this paper here. So the question is, um, you know, when when you don't see a field or crossed out circle, some well you can see right some of the spaces are blank. Um, what what does it mean? Uh, the, uh, so maybe you can kind of tell us and then uh, choose a configuration and illustrate, right? Sure. So uh, we'll look at R1 and we see that um, under the CSAs, we have a blank for host country declining emissions and host country public incentives. And what that means is that those conditions um, can either be present or absent um, or, you know, at a high level or a low level. And and sometimes we use the term, they don't really matter, you know, cause they could be present or absent. And so it, whereas if you're looking at R2, we see that, you know, host country public incentives do matter. And again, the, the high country demand, um, you know, and high uh, country declining emissions are, you know, not uh, contributing. They're not ne needed necessarily for that that causal recipe to lead to the investment in um, renewables. Yeah, so, um, it, you know, it's uh, once you have these conditions that you see in the configuration, you, you get the outcome and um, these other conditions that are blank, whether they are there or not, just just doesn't matter. Uh, you get you get the outcome um, either way. Um, Good. Uh, there is another uh, question uh, for us here. It's not necessarily about uh, about this, um, but um, maybe uh, maybe I'll I'll stop the the screen sharing and we can just uh, talk about some of this stuff. Um, there you go. So the uh, the question uh, is. Um, so one of the attendees is uh, looking at the process of environmental sustainability. In a particular industry, um, by doing case study research, um, what kind of preparation um, is needed to bring configuration analysis, um, you know, uh, from using this data? Uh, the data is going to be. It seems like it will be interview, uh, interview based. Hmm. 
you want me to to take this one uh, well just a, an initial thought is mm -hmm. You know that you're going to find when you're doing the coding of uh, you're, you almost are going to be doing uh, you know traditional kind of qualitative research to find these um, you know these overlapping conditions that would that would be relevant. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, it kind of depends on you know on how many of those are. Um, you know, I don't. Yeah. I'm not. I don't do a lot of qualitative research, so maybe stop. Yeah. Uh, I would say. Um... The, the first thing um, to, uh, to to remember here is that um, configuration analysis is not always needed or is not always uh, appropriate. Um, I think you know something like environmental sustainability. I, I think there's a good chance um, that um, uh, you know configuration analysis could be useful, right? Um, but uh, I think the the first thing to remember is that um, there needs to be uh, some sort of justification, either from a theoretical standpoint or evident in, in the data that the configurational approach is needed. Now, assuming that that's the case, um, interview data is uh, perfectly suitable um, for, for using qualitative comparative analysis or config taking a configurational approach. Um, I, so the Creeley paper that I used as, as, a, as an example so that qualitative comparative analysis came out of interview data um, that was collected from uh, foreign subsidiaries. Um, and there's a process, there's actually quite a few good publications that uh, can serve as, 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 as a guide for the process of how you go from qualitative data to, um, uh, to a configurational um, analysis. Um, but I don't think there is any kind of special preparation, which I think that kind of the questions seem right. What kind of preparation do I need to do to make this configuration? I don't think there's any preparation, particularly in terms of the interviews themselves, um, that uh, should be done to make the study configuration. Yeah, the interview would be more focused on, you know, asking the, the relevant questions and then and then seeing what information comes from the um from the from from the interviews and i think really is actually a good uh, kind of a good example where um you know first came the interviews uh, and uh, the, the goal was not to make a configuration study but from the interviews it seemed like um there there's some complexity that things kind of bundled together in um in non straightforward way um, and it might not be easy to see only working with the interview. So the qualitative comparative analysis was done to flesh that out. Um, can you clarify the difference between big and small circles? I think you mentioned core and periphery when you were going over the, the Patala paper, so maybe kind of in a more general sense. Yeah, so the core conditions are those that are um, you know, definitely linked to the the outcome of interest. Um, they play a, a, a major contributing role, whereas the peripheral or the smaller circles are what we call peripheral, or they have a, it, they're reinforcing. So they're reinforcing um, other peripheral conditions as well as the core conditions. So they're, they're important and, you know, they provide additional, um, you know, they're all, they're part of that, that conjunctural causation that we're interested in. And you can see that it, it varies across configurations. Um, you know, a condition can be core in one and, and more of a reinforcing, again, depending on how they all combine. Um, let's see. Um, so uh, given that the number of causal conditions in a study is, uh, is, is, is finite, uh, how can we account for other possible causal conditions that are not included? So th this is sort of, a, I think, uh, so the parallel to this in the kind of the typical variance-based approach is what about uh, maybe control variables, uh, right? Uh, but also maybe just stuff that might be threat for relevant, but not, you know, uh, so how do we handle that? Well, one way um, that I often, uh, or my approach is, I have an overarching theory. 
And so thinking back to the, the uh, paper that I talked about from uh, Patella and colleagues, you know, they started with the FSA and CSA matrix. And so that, that kind of put some boundaries on, on conditions that you're going to consider. And so that's that's one approach. Oftentimes, though, with configurational studies, we're um, trying to build theory or we're integrating theories. So again, um, for me, that when I'm thinking about the conditions that you know, um, you know, that previous research has has said are important, maybe in a net effects way, I, I want them to be linked through that overarching um, you know theory that I'm I'm drawing from or theories. Yeah, I, I'll add uh, to that that um, the concept of control variables from regression analysis is not really applicable in a set theoretic approach that is based on Boolean algebra. Um, and um, the difference is with a variance-based approach, variables compete to explain variance in an outcome variable. But with a configurational approach that is rooted in set theory, um, it is actually about the um, configurations of conditions that are co-present when the outcome is, is present. Um, however, um, uh, there are several ways to deal with the fact that you might have, for instance, more distal uh, causal conditions that, that could be relevant, um, and the primers, uh, the uh, variety of primers that we have out there do talk about how to handle that. Um, there is indeed um, uh, sort of a, a limit to how many conditions can be um, included in a model uh, before it just becomes um, overly complex. If you think about it, every condition, right? So, so the number of possible configurations is two to the power of K, right? And K is the number of conditions. So every, every condition you add uh, increases the number of configurations by by a lot. Uh, and so um, we do have to be mindful uh, of that. But I think that the key to, uh, to remember here is that uh, the notion of controlling for alternative explanations uh, is not really relevant um, uh, in the way that we think about it in variance-based approaches, because uh, this is not a very variance-based approach. And I would just add too that some of that can come out if you're doing case illustrations. You can you can add some of that additional, um, you know, texture to to your interpretation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you have any examples of papers adopting a configurational approach that is not QCA? Actually, there is a um, there's there's a Jibs article that looks at social entrepreneurship um, by um, oh you can tell I'm not I'm I'm a ways from my PhD days I'm not I don't remember all my sites um, but it talk and they use glo um, the globe cultural dimensions um, um, uh, I think uh, Ulaner is one of the authors. Mm. And they they talk about a configurational approach, and they use, I believe, hierarchical uh, linear modeling. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, I, th I mean, you could take a configurational approach without using QCA. Um, that I think, I mean, uh, some of the earlier research in strategy uh, does that. Uh, there's also, I think, research on kind of like profiles um, in in OBHR. Um, uh, using, um, I think, uh, latent class analysis or so something like that. Um, I, I think you can also take a purely theoretical approach um, uh, and and use configurational thinking to develop a typology, for instance. That's that's configurational. Uh, it's typological, um, and uh, it doesn't use QCA as as an analytical. Uh, tool. So, so I guess it it is possible, um, and um, you know there are some uh, examples out there uh, that are uh, configurational in nature. Essentially, I think every typology uh, is, by definition, configurational, right? And um, and, and I would say yeah. the article I was talking about 
the configurational part was much more part of the theorizing. Um, they they didn't necessarily say we're using configurational methods. It was it was part of the front end theorizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, does QCA allow to achieve a process understanding of mechanisms and causes associated to how and why different conditions led to each outcome? I, I believe so. I think it's that whole idea of, of them being interdependent, the different conditions being interdependent. And, and again, the, the choice of conditions, you know, part of the, the, the way you choose them is that you expect that they're going to be linked together, that they're going to be, um, you know, interdependent, interconnected. And so I, I think that really does you know, it gives it more of a, a dynamic, um, you know, process understanding as opposed to, you know, everything else is, everything's constant. Let's see what this, this condition or variable does. I think, um, so it's not inherently built as a process, uh, as, a, as a method that uncovers process. Uh, I think it gives insights into how and why uh, something leads uh, to, to the outcome because these kinds of uh, uncovering the complementarities and substitutions and these kinds of comparisons um, do give a, a rich insight into what might be happening there. Uh, but it doesn't really explicitly or automatically tell you how or why certain combinations work, um, right? That's, that's something that going back to the cases and, and, and kind of you know, using your substantive knowledge of the of the phenomenon of the cases uh, kind of helps get there. That said, there are some kind of interesting applications of uh, of, of QCA that are a bit more processed. So, for instance, TQCA, temporal QCA, is more about how things are ordered uh, in over time. So it's kind of you know um, there are several ways to incorporate time into into QCA, and there are several primers uh, on that as well. And that can give, I think an even richer uh, uh, look into how things unfold over time in leading uh, to the outcome. Uh, you know, a lot of these approaches are not necessarily, um, uh, you know, super well developed yet. But but I think I agree with Krista that um, it does give some insight and it has the potential to give in more once uh, kind of the, the methodological tools are, are further uh, developed. Um, let's see, um, so can you maybe once again, um, talk about causal asymmetry, especially with the, uh, the paper, uh, with the Patala paper. So kind of how we had like five or six pathways for FDN renewables, but then only for, for the absence of that outcome, right? And that the configurations on that side are not a mirror image of the configurations on the on the other side. Well, and it also relates to the idea that a configuration can have, you know, one configuration can have the presence of that condition and lead, you know, to investment in, in renewables. And another configuration, you can have, you know, it be absent and it leads to it. So that there's that causal asymmetry there also. Um, I, I don't have the, as far as the, if, if you, so if you take one of the configurations, R1, is it possible to put the slide back up or, um, yeah, one second. might just be easier to. So, you know, it, looking at, let's compare, um, you know, R1 and, uh, and R1, renewable one and non-renewable. So we do see that there, you know, the the FSAs are, you know, for the investment in renewables, we we do see that we have, you know, differing conditions between, you know, NR1 and R1 with regards to the technological capabilities and international experience, but they both show that the, um, you know, that privately owned firms, you know, are both investing, you know, so that condition remains the same. And then we look at, 
um, you know, with the CSAs, the, you know, an NR1 having uh, declining emissions is, you know, has to be present where for R1, it, it might be present because it's a blank, but it also might be absent. And so we're not seeing the, the mirror, um, you know, like with a linear regression, you either have a positive or negative um, impact. And here we can see that depending on how the conditions combine, we, you know, they they may both be present and absent. So Stav, you wanna help with that a little bit? I don't know if there's- No, I mean, I, I, yeah, no, I think it's, it's. Uh, I mean, you can see the asymmetry, first of all, in terms of the number of solution, the number of configurations. You can see that even though some configurations might be essentially uh, the opposite, Mm -hmm. uh, the mirror image of some, but that's not generally, that's not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. And and oftentimes it's not. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you you might have situations and you can see it in several paper like Paraphysis uh, paper in AMJ where actually the absence of the outcome has no configurations mm -hmm. associated. So there are no systematic ways to combine the conditions in his study right. uh, and even, to bring yeah, about the outcome. Yeah, and even looking at NR2 and NR3, um, you know, they're leading to the same outcome and the conditions are in many cases, the direct opposite, but they're leading to the same income. So there's our income outcome, excuse me. <laughs> yes. um, so there's two questions here that I think we can um, uh, answer at the same time. Um, examples of QCA with a temporal component. Are there any examples or, uh, mm -hmm. or primers? So I, I think there are, um, so I'll mention two off the top of my head. Um, one, uh, there is a paper by Barbara Viss, uh, and I don't remember the exact uh, title uh, or the year of the paper. It's pretty recent. That mm -hmm. actually summarizes three different ways of incorporating time uh, into uh, QCA. And you know, it, inside that paper, there's references to all kinds of other um, uh sources that are useful. And then there is an interesting exchange, I think from 2005, uh, about uh, temporal QCA, uh, which is one type of incorporating time uh, into QCA. And I think Charles Reagan is actually part of that exchange, um, where some authors suggest a way to do temporal QCA, and then there's criticism of it. And then there's... so um, those are kind of the two uh, starting points uh, for that. Um, and um, if interested, you can reach out to me after the session and I can uh, reply with um, with those with those references. Um, in terms of doing robustness tests or QCA, so other than uh, the consistency and the frequency thresholds, anything else um, that needs to be done. Occasionally, um, I, I do uh, differing calibration levels. We didn't haven't really talked about calibration as part of the, the process with QCA. Um, if you have non, um, you know, if your conditions aren't zero, one, and you, you're using fuzzy sets, sometimes changing um, reviewers like to see the, um, you know, what, how things change if you uh, change those calibration levels, you know, instead of uh, using the 85th percentile, use the 75th or or something like that. Um, it, sometimes, um, you know, differing measures, the, you know, different measurements like you would do in a, in a normal correlation based. Um, so uh, let me also take this opportunity to also thank uh, the, the attendees for the great questions. The questions yes. are are very good. Um, so if, if you have any more, uh, let us know. We're, we're trying to get to to, to as many as, as, as we can. Um, when people ask, is QCA a qualitative or quantitative method? How, how do I respond? Both. <laughs> it's or or it depends. No, it um, it, it really is, um, you know, Stav and I, in some of our work, we've, we've talked about this idea of how it's, it can be both deductive and inductive, you know, within the same study. Uh, so there's, you know, in, in some research or some studies, it will come across as it's more quantitative versus the qualitative. 
Um, you know, and the, the article that I talked about, the, the qualitative part really has to do with, with the richness that they, um, they bring to the study with these case illustrations, talking specifically about uh, these different uh, electric utility firms and, and, you know, where they're from and where they're going and, and how they've, um, you know, how they run their business. Yeah, it's I QCA started uh I mean, started a long time ago. It's not it's not a new technique. It's been around it's just, it's it's new to, to us, you know, speaking, but it's been around for a while. Uh and it came about as a way to um give more quantifiability or a bit more kind of uh uh, uh, uh quantitative uh rigor to uh to qualitatively rigorous, but you know, stuff that could be uh kind of I guess visualized or patterns that would be affected more quantitatively. Um and so um you know it has the word qualitative in the name, but it's it it is um in many ways quantitative. It is truly in between. Uh it has elements of of both uh like like you said. So um this is this is not a one zero uh kind of a kind of an answer. <laughs> Um, to what extent is QCA robust when applied to large N? I'm sorry, could you, I didn't catch the first part of that. What? Um, to what extent is QCA robust when applied to large sample, large N? So I, I, I mean, we've, there's been a lot of um, QCA done with large N in the last, mm -hmm. you know, especially since, um, you know, we, we had this neo configurational type of, um, you know, uh, concept. And it's, I mean, it's very similar to um, what you would do with a smaller N, the, you know, as far as the robustness um, there, you possibly aren't going to cover as many, you know, depending how large an N it is, you may not um, you know, cover as many of the the cases, but we have you know when you when you're actually doing the analysis, there are certain guidelines you follow, like your your frequency uh, threshold should make sure that it includes you know at least eighty percent of the cases, and so there there's certain you know guidelines with the actual way you do the analysis that that helps um, you know keep that uh, that rigor when you, if you whether you're using small or large. Um, yeah, I think it, um, uh, as the N, uh, go, you know, as it goes up, um, um, you are probably less intimately familiar, uh, with, with the cases, right? So, uh, then what happens is you might have more measurement error, or you might have cases, you know, problematic cases that maybe shouldn't be there, right? So like that, that kind of stuff. So, and, and I think that's the case with, quantitative research as well, right? The more you deal with with bigger data sets, the less you know each and every observation or case um, in this data. And it's be it eventually becomes impossible to 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 know. Um, but um, but QCA can be rigorous for large N. And like Krista said, has been applied quite uh, quite a bit uh, to, to large N. And it is because there are ways to counter some of this potential error um, uh, with uh, frequency thresholds and calibration sensitivities and so on. So there's nothing inherently problematic about applying QCA to um, to larger uh, sample size. Um, uh, Jill, uh, can, do, we, um, do we have to wrap up or can we uh, I mean, it's a, a bit? Yeah, yeah, we can go over a bit if you feel, I know it's a, a topic and I think the audience is very engaged too. So if you all wanted to go over okay. a little well, bit, me. yeah. Okay. Okay. So we, I see there's one more question. So I'm, um, yeah. So the, the question is, um, what is the condition? Or, or a set, it, it is essentially the same thing. It is a construct. I mean, the, I mean, it's different as as you said in the um, beginning, it's different than a variable, but at the end of the day, it's still a, 
a, a construct and the <laughs> it, no, it, it has construct like properties, yeah, right? But it does not always have to be something abstract. Uh, so typically, when we talk about constructs, we have this kind of notion that, oh, it's something that you know abstract, you, it's very it's, it's not easy to measure, so we, we proxy it. Uh, but the condition does not have to be right. The condition is something that is defined by the researcher. Uh, mm -hmm. Often that has a, a meaning to um, uh, to to your to your study. So, for instance, um, uh, you know ROA is a variable that is calculated, right? But something like not high performance is a condition that I define because it is of interest and meaning in my study, and I can use the ROA data and make a judgment call or what I consider as not a high performance based on that. I mean, we can have a separate discussion about how I make this judgment call, but um, that would essentially be transforming a variable into a condition. And that condition can be all kinds of things that the researcher is interested in. High performance, very high performance, not high performance, not terrible performance, mediocre performance. And you can define um, you know, almost infinite uh, number of conditions uh, even from the same variable, right? So condition is something that, has, that it is a construct, you're right. Uh, the reason I just wanted to, to qualify that is that we are not really, it's not construct in the way that we typically think about something something abstract that we can only have proxies for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the more specifically labeled the set or condition is, uh, the better, uh, the, the easier the judgment call becomes in terms of how do you determine membership in that mm -hmm. condition? How do you determine degree of membership um, in that in in that condition? So, and and sometimes they are more clearly defined. Like in the example I covered, they're they're a state owned MNE or they're not. You know, so there isn't. You know, yeah. that that's more that's easier to define or calibrate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, OK, good. So I, I think I think we're doing uh, we did pretty good on on tackling some of these uh, some of these questions. And of course, uh, uh, Krista and I are not hard to find uh, <laughs> if, if there are other um, other questions or, or anybody needs any kind of guidance with with configurational uh, thinking, theorizing, analysis, um, whatever it is, especially I think on the theorizing side, these are not uh, super prevalent uh, uh, practices yet uh, in our field. And it's, it's, it's challenging, but it's, it's kind of cool. But um, the, um, I think the potential of this to, especially for things like, uh, like grand challenges, right? Things that are complex, um, is there. Um, it's it's a really cool theoretical and empirical way of of, of examining um, that um, that is useful. Um, it's not inherently better than variance-based approaches or regression or anything like, like that. It is just very different and it can allow us to do things that uh, variance-based approaches cannot and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's all for today, right? Did you have any, anything else that you wanted to say? No, I just, again, want to thank the participants for their engagement, their great questions. And uh, thank you, uh, Jillian and Lucy, for the opportunity to uh, to be involved in this. Thank you. And stop. Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you very much, Tav and Krista, for the very informative discussion. And also to the audience, um, we normally don't have that many I mean, we always have questions, but never as many. So this has been a record and we have a a top tier uh, audience today who's very engaged, which is really great. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, well, thank you all. And um, please do look forward to future webinars by Cyber and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye.